This is Dr. Karen, and this is the Are They 18 Yet podcast, where I help parents raise independent, self-sufficient kids without sacrificing their own identity and sense of purpose. I'm here to share practical day-to-day solutions for raising kind, successful, well-adjusted human beings and actionable advice for supporting systemic changes so we can make this world a more inclusive, accepting place now and for future generations. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 41 of the Are They 18 Yet podcast. So in this episode, I'm going to do something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and so what this is, it's going to be a re-release of one of the very first episodes of the show. And the reason that I'm doing this is because when I launched the show, I had kind of a broad goal of what I wanted to do with it. I wanted it to be about helping kids to grow up and be successful. But what has ended up happening, and and I kind of expected this, is that we really focused around supporting parents, clinicians, and educators of kids with disabilities and also really focusing around the topic of neurodiversity, specifically ADHD. We've talked a lot about that. And I do want to cover other topics, but I am going to continue in the new year with the same theme, really focusing around supporting the adults who are supporting kids who are wired a little bit differently and helping to understand how we can support them and help them to grow up to be successful adults. This was originally episode three. I sat down and had a conversation with my husband, Joe, because back when he was in elementary school, he did get evaluated for ADHD. He did not officially get a diagnosis, but they said, you're about one question away from having it. And I think that if he would have continued to you know, get a second opinion, he probably would have gotten diagnosed eventually just based on the number of tendencies that I have observed in him. But the reason that I wanted to share this story with all of you is because there's a lot of different opinions about how to support kids. But in the moment when you are supporting any one child, it can be hard to tell, all right, what's going to happen? You know, I wish we had a crystal ball that would tell us, are we on the right track? Are we not? And so I wanted to share his story with all of you because we actually know what happened. And in the original interview, I broke it up into two parts. I broke it up into the first part, which is what I'm going to share today. He shared his perspective of what happened when he was in elementary school through high school. And then in the second episode, which is going to be re-released next week, that is, all right, what happened when he was in college and what happened, you know, how did he turn things around for himself? I have said before, it's kind of a cautionary tale of, you know, there are some things that can happen if we don't give kids the opportunity to learn how to discipline themselves and structure their own environment. And then all of a sudden they go from having a lot of structure and accountability in place. And then all of a sudden they don't have any of that, which happens a lot in college. So what I'm going to do is hop over to the original introduction to the breaking point episode so that you can get the whole picture of how that went down and get that whole narrative. And then next week will be a re-release of the second part of his story. So with that, I'll go ahead and hop over to that re-release of The Breaking Point. So I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about what was hard for you as a kid when it came to attention and focus. I had had been diagnosed with, I think it was like near ADD. So I was... um, tested for attention deficit disorder because of some signs that I was showing at school and what have you. And I think it was like one or two questions away from being 
actually diagnosed uh, out of the 150 question quiz, which I always thought was kind of funny that you had to take that long of a quiz if you have attention deficit disorder. But yeah, so I, I just, I always found myself struggling at times when I was looking at things and, and studying things or doing things that didn't necessarily interest me, but I was able to be hyper-focused on things that I really liked or things that I had interest in. So who, well, first of all, how old were you? When I had my test? Yeah. That would have been, that was a long time ago. Uh, I think it would have been somewhere between like fifth and sixth grade. And who referred you? Was it your teacher? Um, it was, yes, it was my teacher. So I, I was in an advanced math class and I was held back from continuing to be in the advanced math class because I was struggling with the reading portion. Uh, I believe it was in fourth grade with the reading problems and the comprehension. And so they decided to test me to see if, if there was an issue. Who was it that you went to? Do you remember what kind of a doctor it was? Or It was a doctor that had a lab and equipment. <laughs> I, as, as a 11 or 12 year old, I, I did not ask a whole lot of questions. Um, but if, if I remember correctly, I was in a room and they were asking me questions and I was answering things and then they would give me stimuli to um, distract me essentially and then continue to ask me other questions. Um, so it was like a structured thing. It wasn't, I wasn't in the back of a van or something like that. <laughs> yeah. What happened after that? I mean, did they, did anything different happen? Did they tell you to do something differently or did they just say, here's the test and there you go. Like, what was that? What was your perception of that as an 11 year old kid? So my perception was, um, everything's okay. You're, you're good. Um, I, I never took any medication, um, never prescribed anything. And, um, they just said it, it's something that, you know, we should consider and think about, but it was never something that was addressed with any type of medication or any type of um, structured learning program or anything like that. At this point in the interview, I was really trying to figure out what his thoughts were. What was going through his head when all of this was happening? Now, of course, if we are considering a diagnosis, if a child is referred for an evaluation, we don't want them to feel bad. We don't want them to feel like there's something wrong with them. So while I think it was good that his perception was, I'm good, I'm okay. At the same time, I'm sitting here wondering, thinking, well, if you were two questions away, if this was enough of an issue that you were having the evaluation in the first place, was it the right choice to not really do anything different? Maybe medication wouldn't have been the best choice for him. I'm definitely not a huge proponent of medication. I don't take medication myself, and I wouldn't really want to make that decision for one of my family members. But what about some strategies and skills? As he said, there was no structured program or anything done to actually work on some of the things that he needed help with working on. He mentioned comprehension and being held back from being in an advanced math class because reading was an issue. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened had he started to work on some of these skills early on, as opposed to having to wait until he was an adult, which of course we talk about later. But let's get back into what happened after this evaluation. So after that, what happened? Like when you you were maybe in late elementary school and then you there was middle school, high school. I mean, what happened then? So I, I had a couple interesting life events um, through middle school up and through high school. In middle school, I had gotten a really bad case of poison ivy and was forced to stay home for an extended period of time, almost, I believe it was like two weeks. 
and obviously there was still quite a lot of homework uh, to be done. And it was such a bad case that actually my right eye was completely swollen shut. So I, it was hard for me to see. It was hard for me to hold um, writing utensils or anything. And so what we did in, in order for me to continue my work was my mom would kind of dictate my answers and what have you. And the teachers at first kind of came back and questioned whether or not my mom was basically writing answers, you know, that I wasn't giving um, because it, it was not the same answers as um, I was giving previously. And that actually might have been what caused us to, to go into um, the, the doctor to, to get it tested. I do distinctly remember my mom saying that there was a drastic difference in, in the work that I was completing and what I was saying versus what I was writing. And then the same thing kind of happened in high school. I had um, a major hip surgery and missed the last two months of school, give or take month and a half. And so again, I, I actually took summer school to make up for the time that I missed. And again, the grades and, and my attention spiked because I had this like one-on-one -on -one kind of uh, interaction with a teacher rather than a larger class. So they thought, okay, you're actually doing better now that you have more one-on-one -on -one attention. So maybe there's something to that. I wanted to take a second and point out here a couple things that were going on. First of all, if you are familiar with the school systems, then you know that there are certain cases where if a child is diagnosed with a certain condition, they might qualify for different accommodations educationally. One of those things can be things like having a test read to them, unless it's a reading test, of course. But if it's something like social studies, science, and the primary purpose is to just see if they know the content. And if they're someone who struggles with reading comprehension, they can actually have the test read to them if they qualify for that accommodation. Another thing to consider here is that an accommodation could also be having a scribe. So if a child has a disability or a certain diagnosis that would indicate that they are not able to adequately access the curriculum if they are not able to dictate their responses. So for example, again, if an assessment is not testing writing and the primary purpose of the question is just to see if that student can give an answer and explain that they know the content and we don't want to necessarily hinder their ability to show that by requiring them to write, then they can qualify to have a scribe. And these days, a lot of times there are other technologies that can make this possible without requiring a person to do it. But for some kids, they do need that person to write down what they're actually saying. So when my husband is saying here that he did way better with his mom writing the responses, there are a couple things that could happen, which, which do happen sometimes. Number one is that what the teacher suspected could have been happening which is that sometimes parents, teachers, whoever is helping the child might be actually not writing exactly what they're saying and something gets lost in translation. And without knowing it, that person who's writing those responses is actually helping or filling in the blanks where that particular student isn't being clear. But what was probably more likely happening was that when my husband was dictating the responses, his thoughts were actually getting down on paper effectively. So if that's the case, then what can sometimes happen for people who have things like attention issues, who have a hard time with executive functioning? What happens is that they do have the thoughts in their heads, but somehow it just doesn't get onto the paper. So they might be able to say it out loud, but something about the writing process, whether it be the spelling, whether it be the additional cognitive load, doesn't quite 
make it to the paper. And that was most likely happening here, which in this case seems like it might have been what prompted the evaluation in the first place. The interesting thing about this particular situation is that while he was doing okay and he did even better with the one-on-one support, he was still making adequate progress in school, so didn't qualify for any specialized services that enabled him to get special accommodations. In this case, he was just getting them temporarily because he had a medical reason. But that didn't necessarily translate to what happened when he went to college. So that's what we get into next. You are listening to the Are They 18 Yet? podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Karen. If you're enjoying this episode, I'd love if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. All you need to do to leave a review is open the podcast app that you use and navigate to the Are They 18 Yet? podcast page. Then scroll down to the subhead titled Ratings and Reviews and select Write a Review. So that was junior high and high school, right? Yeah. What happened in college? A lot of fun happened in college. Do do you want me to talk about my educational experience in college? Yes, let's get into that. Hmm. I went away to college, uh, about an hour away from my hometown, and I struggled my freshman year um, with grades, but nothing too horrible. I mean, I don't know exactly what my GPA was. It was probably like a 2.0, so it wasn't great. But during my freshman year, I found it to be a real struggle to balance all of the college-like activities, right? So um, not only the social activities, but the class, the studying, and really understand what it meant to be a college student. And when I went back on in my sophomore year, I moved into my fraternity house and all of those problems that I was experiencing in my freshman year just exploded. So at one point in time, apparently, a 19 year old me felt like it was a good idea to only show up during test days um, because those these were large lecture, lecture halls and the only time that um, you know there, there was an actual grade graded assignment was on test day. So I can read the book and um, take the test. And as you can imagine, um, I didn't read the book during the weeks of class and showed up for the test and you know crammed the night before and was very unprepared. And reality set in, I think about probably a little over halfway through the semester when I sat in one of my classes and everybody had their notebooks out and I was ready to take a test. And I asked the person sitting next to me, you know, why they've got all their notebook stuff out that we got a test today. And, you know, the, the person next to me said that the professor rescheduled that to the week before. It, it helps to understand that back in those days, the internet was kind of around, but it wasn't widespread as it is today. And so, you know, we didn't have like updated class schedules and and things like that. You actually had to go into class to understand if there was a change. So it was at that point in time that that I understood that I was in real deep trouble and um, could not have gone any worse that particular semester. Zero, zero is the lowest GPA you can get in a semester. And I hit that. Do you think if the internet was around, would you have thought to to check the schedule? I mean, do you think that it inevitably would have happened regardless? If the internet was around, I would have been in a lot more trouble because it would have taken me away from school even more. And so when I was actually trying to study, I would have just surfed the internet and gone down an endless rabbit hole of YouTube or something along those lines. So in a way, it, it could have helped because I would have probably known that there was a test and, and that it got rescheduled. But on the on the flip side of things, when I would actually go to study, my already poor study habits would have been uh, expanded even further. So when you were not in class, what... I mean, what distractions were around without getting into too many details? Well, it's college. Um, so, it, it, again, you know, 
I always joke that there's always somebody doing something, somebody's birthday, somebody's party, you know, so somebody's celebrating getting a good grade or... Um, they celebrated that? Yeah, not me, <laughs> but, but others did. You know, I mean, any any excuse to celebrate, people would go out and celebrate. And that that drew me in. I was also working and the, the short-sighted nature of, hey, I'm making pretty good money at my job, so I'll pick up a few more hours and um, I can actually work through class and then just study later. It all compounded into a lot of poor decisions. So it, again, it, it was all things that in, in retrospect and, and looking back were all waste of time. But it, it seemed, it didn't seem more important, but it seemed more interesting. And so I, I chose to do what I thought was more interesting rather than, uh, or more fun, if you would, rather than doing what I uh, perceived as boring, um, especially because a lot of those classes in my sophomore year were classes that didn't interest me. You know, I, weather, the weather classes, I, I would never... I mean, I, I want to know what the weather is when I look outside, but I didn't, he didn't necessarily understand what different clouds were or things like that. And so um, I found, found myself finding reasons to skip. Looking back to when you got tested, when they said you almost have ADHD or however that test came out when you were fifth, sixth grade and you thought, oh, everything is okay. I mean, looking back, do you think there are things you could have been working on that could have better prepared you for college or young adulthood? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, with, without a doubt, um, you know, my, my experience in taking nothing away from my parents or my teachers or anything like that, but I was very ill-prepared when I went off to college and it was a recipe for disaster. I, there, there was there was very little in my tool belt that would have uh, let me succeed in a college environment. How so? Um, just you know, the the time management skills, um, understanding what what is important and what is not important, and prioritizing what I do with my time. Understanding how I can learn and study and what works for me and what doesn't work for me. I, I had to learn basically how I best was able to absorb information. So now you're, you have a college degree, you have a bachelor's and a master's degree. How were you able to turn it around and actually go back and be successful the second time around? So, um, and, and I always like to joke, I'm probably one of the very few people who flunked out of Illinois State University and was able to go back and get a master's degree from there. So, yeah, it, it's there, there was a definite light switch kind of moment um, after my failure, literally and figuratively, um, in, in school uh, after my third semester, I, I, left the, I left the college. And rightfully so, my, my parents who were helping me and, and helping pay tuition um, felt betrayed, and rightfully so again. But, you know, they said that, that they were, were basically done helping out. And so it, it, that by itself changed, you know, the paradigm. At this point in time, I'm going to wrap up this portion of the interview because this is kind of a good stopping point. Because now we're at the transition where he was able to turn things around. So that's what we're going to get into in the next episode, which will be episode four of the Are They 18 Yet podcast. But I wanted to point out here that while he was holding it together during a structured environment, when he was left to structure things on his own, things fell apart. And I can't tell you how common this is where sometimes the cracks of a shaky foundation are exposed when there is some sort of challenge. I think this year, as I'm recording this with remote learning, this has happened with a lot of kids where they had the structure of school and then as soon as they had to keep themselves accountable and create their own structure, a lot of kids who struggled with staying organized and with those executive functioning skills, like I've mentioned before, 
a lot of those issues came out and multiplied even more without the structure of traditional school. Now, the interesting thing when you think about college is that this happens with a lot of kids who might be able to hold it together with the structure of having their parents there to hold them accountable and with someone keeping tabs on them, taking attendance in class and things like that. And then when you get to college and you don't have somebody who's making sure that you get up and go to class and you don't get a detention for not showing up on time or being tardy, then sometimes that external accountability, when it goes away, it can be really hard for kids who don't have well-developed executive functioning skills, like I've mentioned before. What can be really hard is the future pacing element. So thinking about, okay, if I want to reach this goal in the future, what do I need to be doing right now in order to get there? Like I said before, it doesn't mean that they don't care about the future. It's just simply a matter of having the skills to future pace. And the interesting thing is that People who are highly intelligent sometimes don't have this skill. I used to do consulting for people who were finishing their dissertations. And you would think when I'm helping people write their dissertations that I would be doing a lot of editing and consulting on drafts, which I did a little bit. But what I was doing more of was essentially helping people structure their lives so that they were actually able to make time to write, follow up with their professors at the right time. I realized after the fact that I was doing more coaching in executive functioning for these individuals than I was really giving writing advice or talking about grammar and punctuation and other things that you might have to do if you are writing a really long draft of something. And I thought that was interesting because if you look at what has to happen in order for you to write a dissertation, You have to figure out how to plan on your own, how to get this huge project done. And a lot of times people would struggle at this point in their degree when they have to write a thesis or a dissertation because you have to self-pace and set your own deadlines, which requires executive functioning. And so sometimes people would have the skills to be able to follow through with due dates for their classes, even in college, because they had some kind of deadline imposed on them for their class, for the mini projects that they had to do. But then when they were left to create those deadlines on their own, then things fell apart and they weren't able to balance it. So I thought that was really interesting. And I wanted to point that out because the point here is that when people struggle with staying accountable, going to class and and getting good grades, a lot of times it's not a matter of how intelligent they are. It is a matter of executive functioning skills like I've talked about. There's actually not a direct correlation between IQ and executive functioning, meaning that someone can be highly intelligent, someone like my husband who has really fast processing skills when it comes to math. He can do calculations in his head faster than I can even fathom a lot of times when we're doing things that involve high-level strategy and planning and processing with having to make calculations and strategy, like playing cards, for example. He always beats me. I can never beat him. And it's because he has those really fast processing skills and he has certain skills that are very well-developed and certain abilities that are extremely advanced But when it came to the big picture, when he was 18 or 19, he didn't quite have those skills that fall in line with executive functioning. So I wanted to point that out because a lot of times people think that they're not capable if they aren't getting good grades and if they aren't able to do well in classes like college courses. But it isn't necessarily a measure of your intelligence or your ability. A lot of times, it's just a matter of honing these skills in a way that works for you. 
in the next episode, I am going to get into what he did in order to be able to do that. Because what happens is that for people who need to develop those executive functioning skills, there's always this breaking point to where the situation gets too challenging in order for them to follow through. So for some people, for some kids nowadays, for example, it was the remote learning where they might have been able to hold it together a little bit when they were in a regular school setting and then things fell apart when they had to do remote learning. Or for my husband, he was able to follow through and hang in there when he was living at home with his parents and then things fell apart when he went to college. For other people, they might be able to get through college and then when they get to their thesis, things fall apart then. There is a breaking point for everyone and it's just a matter of understanding the skills that you need in order to be successful and putting yourself in the environment so that you have the right supports in place. Some people might be able to tolerate living in a fraternity house and being able to go to class and keep their grades up. Other people know that that's not a good situation for them. So as we are supporting my stepdaughter, for example, knowing that she has some of the same tendencies as my husband, we are really proactive in making her aware of where she might need to structure her environment so that she's setting herself up for success and at the same time building the skills that she needs in order to stay organized and disciplined. So we'll get into how that looked for my husband and how he was able to turn things around and go back, finish his bachelor's while working full time, and also eventually go back to the same university that he ended up leaving and got a master's degree. So stay tuned for next week's episode for the rest of that story. Before I wrapped up, I wanted to let you know, again, it helps us so much if you leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. That helps us to get the show and this information into the ears of the people who need it. Also, before I wrap up, I wanted to remind you about my free parent guide. Really, this is a guide for anyone who is supporting kids who need to work on executive functioning. So this could be appropriate for speech pathologists, for teachers, for other therapists, as well as parents who want to support kids who are working on executive functioning, as we talked a lot about in this episode today. In this guide, I walk through the types of executive functioning skills, including red flags, to tell if your child is someone who needs to work on this area. So if you have a child who has a hard time with following simple directions or doing tasks that require multiple steps and planning, or if they are someone who has a hard time keeping their things organized, keeping track of assignments and deadlines, and just overall struggles with time management or procrastination, then I highly recommend checking out the parent guide that will walk you through the types of executive functioning skills. To grab that guide, all you need to do is go to drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash parent guide, and you'll be able to sign up for your free copy. Again, that's drkarendudekbrannon.com backslash parent guide. As always, thank you so much for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode, which is going to be a re-release of the second part of this interview. 